Good morning, church. I hope you're doing well. A little change of scenery. What you see behind me is not a green screen. It's actual furniture. <laughs> I'm recording from my home uh, for the very first time. As you may know, due to MCO, we're restricted from uh, going to church. And as a result, I'm recording from my home. And this is an awkward and uh, interesting experience for me. I know for some of our leaders, like Sister Sharon, Sister Ern, they have experienced recording from home, but it honestly really feels awkward. But um, that is not going to stop our ministry. Ministry continues no matter what. Amen? And um, church, I just want to say that I'm so grateful to God and Pastor Paul because I have this opportunity to actually uh, preach the gospel in this brand new year. You know, a brand new year brings about new aspirations, new dreams, new desires, uh, new plans. But a new year church also serves a reminder that the days and time is coming to a close. You know, uh, a couple of days ago, I celebrated um, my 24th birthday. I'm almost a quarter of a century. And, um, you know, we had a small do in my home. We had some food and uh, we had a good time of fellowship. Uh, my parents and I and my sister. And, you know, um, after fellowshipping and uh, it was time to go to bed, we cleaned up. I went up to bed and I was, I was lying down, um, about to go to sleep. I had some thoughts running through my head at that time. And the thoughts were like this. So you've lived 24 years. What have you done in that 24 years? Have you used that 24 years to glorify God? Has your life been for His glory? Are you pursuing desires and aspirations that have an expiry date? Or are you pursuing desires and aspirations that are of eternal value? And those were the things that were running through my head, my head church. And um, it's good sometimes as a reality check because the older we get, we have to think about these things. What are we doing with our lives? But one particular thought ran through my head and this was really the start and the genesis of this message, um, that thought was this. What do you believe? Do you know what you believe? Or are you just following a herd and believing what people say? Do you really know what you believe? Is your belief based on the scriptures? And that got me thinking. And so, as you might know already, you've seen the title. The title of my message today is Know What You Believe. Amen? So, I'm going to pray, church, and um, I'm going to do something a little bit different today. If it's possible, I want you to stretch your hands towards the screen. If you are watching it from your phone, stretch your hands towards the phone. Uh, if you're watching it on a TV, do that as well. Stretch your hands. I know um, praying for me, this, this message is uh, probably, have been recorded. It's probably recorded already by now. But I truly believe that God is timeless. And if you pray right now, I believe, I truly believe that even as I speak, God will use every word to minister to your questions and to what you really need to hear. So I'm going to pray right now. I, I hope that you're stretching your hands toward me. And we're going to pray together. Amen. Let's do it. Father, I thank you for this wonderful day that you have made. And I pray, Father, that you will use me as your vessel, as your mouthpiece, Father. Let not I speak, for whatever I speak is of no value. What you speak, Father, will change lives. And I pray, Father, that you use every single word that I say, Father, for your glory. I pray that you will minister to your children. And I pray that they will have a receptive heart, Father, to receive your word, Father. Let me be clear. Let me be concise, Father, in whatever I say. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. Church, if you will, would you turn with me to John 3, 16. <laughs> 
a very, very famous text. I think most of you know it by heart. If you went to Sunday school, probably a Sunday school teacher would have drilled it into you. I know my Sunday school teacher did that to me. I, I know it by heart right now, and I'm sure most of you do. But I didn't really understand um, what the scripture actually meant. I knew it in my head. But today we're going to really discover what it is that we should know about our belief. And I tell you, from this beautiful scripture church, God has unveiled so many things to me. I'm going to share three points and I'm going to deliver it to you in a moment. But let, let's read John uh, 3.16. This is our source text for today. I'm reading from the Amplified Classic Version. So if you have your Bibles with you. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son so that whoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on him, shall not perish, come to destruction, be lost, but have eternal, everlasting life. God bless his word. Church, point number one. If you're taking notes, write this down. God is Love. Let me repeat that. God is love. It sounds simple. It sounds obvious. But I just want to elaborate on this point. Taken from this very scripture itself. It says that for God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world. And now, to be loved by God, church is amazing. Even a crazy thought. But to be greatly loved by God, now that's another level. Can you imagine God so greatly loves us? He dearly prizes us. We have so much value to Him. And that might be hard to believe right now. You might be sitting in your chair, in your seat, and you might be thinking, we just went through a pandemic. For the most part of last year, we were locked in our homes. We couldn't go out. Our livelihoods were threatened. And the worst of all, lives were lost. Church, I checked right before I got uh, to this message. Over 2 million people are dead. That's reality. 2 million beds are left vacant today. 2 million seats are not filled. 2 million loved ones are lost forever. That begs the question, does God still love us so greatly? Does God really prize us so much? I know that this is a question that you might be struggling with right now. You probably asked that question by someone. What's so great about your God? We are going through so many struggles, so many trials. Did God really stop loving us? Church, I want to tell you this. God never stopped loving us because He sent into the world the greatest love of all and that is, and He is, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that He sent His one and only Son. That church is the greatest love of all. A love that we can never find in this world. A love that we can never find even from a dad or mom. This is the greatest love of all that men will ever see, that men will ever know. 
So then why? So then why is all this happening? Why is God allowing this to happen? So many lives lost. Why? Church, I just want to tell you the reason right now. When God does things, He does things with an eternal purpose. For God, eternity is more important than the temporal. And I'm just going to quote you the scripture right now from Matthew 16, verse 25 to 26. And it says this, For whoever is bent, that Jesus is speaking, on saving his temporal life, his comfort and security here, shall lose it, the eternal life. And whoever loses his life, his comfort and security here in this world, for my sake shall find it, life everlasting. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life, his blessed life in the kingdom of God? Or what would a man give as an exchange for his blessed life in the kingdom of God. For God, eternity is more important than the temporal. Eternity is like the ocean. Our temporal life is like a drop of water. In the scorching sun church, the drop of water will dry up. It will cease to exist. But the ocean since Adam has remained so is eternity. It will remain forever. And that is most important. Church, sometimes God allows struggles. God allows trials. God allows tribulations. Because you know what? Tribulations lead you to God. Lead you to trust Him. Lead you to believe Him. Because it's only in believing Him where you receive and where you re- retain salvation. It's only through believing Him. I just want to share you another scripture taken from 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10. I'm reading uh, from a piece of paper I printed out because I don't have a screen with me, so bear with me, church. So for the sake of Christ, I am well pleased. This is Paul talking, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10. So for the sake of Christ, I am well pleased and take pleasure in infirmities, insults, hardship, persecutions, perplexities, and distresses. For when I am weak in human strength, then I am truly strong, able, powerful in divine strength. When we are at our lowest, God's strength is made evident. We rely on Him. We believe in Him. And that's how our salvation church is intact. Amen? And, you know, church, in the world is getting darker and darker by day. And, and the COVID-19, this coronavirus, is... Another thing that adds to the darkness of this world. People are really losing it. People are going through mental health issues. Nothing like we've seen before. But but God revealed this to me as I was preparing this message. So share me out. The brightness of light is most evident in the darkest of night. Let me repeat that. The brightness of light is most evident in the darkest of night. Church, Jesus is the light of the world. The darker the world gets, the brighter his light shines. Jesus is the gospel. The light of the gospel is shining brighter than it's ever been before. And it's our duty, church, It is our duty to spread this light 
to the world so that many can receive the wonderful salvation only provided by Jesus Christ. Church, we have this mandate, we have this duty, we have this great commission to share the gospel. So be brave, church. Be brave. Share the love of God. Share the light of the gospel. You know, God has given us a platform to speak. God has given us a voice to be heard. One example could be our social media platform. You know, it's never been easier to share the Word of God, to share the light of the Gospel. With one click of a button, go to our YouTube channel. When you click the word share, when you click the button share, our messages can travel, can travel continents, can travel countries, just by a click of a button. So it is our duty, church, it's our mandate to share the light of this gospel. Because now, church, so many people are in need and this gospel is the only thing that can save them. Don't be shy. Don't let the devil trap you from sharing this beautiful gospel. You know, a personal testimony, um, before, a couple of years ago, I would say, the devil put a, uh, um, an obstacle in my way. He hindered me from sharing the gospel in my social media platform. And uh, it's because, you know, sometimes you feel shy of what people think of you. You feel shy of uh, what people may say. But church, this gospel is more important than what you think. And when I came to that realization, I decided, hey, my life is for His glory. Whatever platform I have, whatever voice that I have in this world, I'm going to use it completely for His glory. So church, break that chain that the devil has put on you. Share this beautiful gospel. I tell you, one click of a button can save lives. And this gospel is worth sharing because this gospel is the only truth that saves. Amen. God is love, church. Share his love. Amen. Amen. Point number two, church, from the scripture. God is righteous. I'm going to pick up from one line in this verse. So that whoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on him, shall not perish. Let's stop there. Let's stop there. God is righteous. And this is so fitting that this point comes after God is love. Now church... There are a group of people in this world that think that if God is love, if God is so loving, so gracious, so merciful, how can He allow men to perish? How can He allow men to go to hell? He's so loving, He's so gracious. You know, I think that maybe... I mean, I don't think that God will be so bad, be so harsh. He's so good. He's so loving. I'm sure He will, you know, allow me to, to get into heaven. Maybe not so smoothly, but I think He will. He's, he's a God of love. I don't think He wants to put me in hell. Church, I want you to know this. As much as He is perfect in love, He's also perfect in righteousness. He's perfectly righteous. Let me give you an example here. Example of a policeman, a scenario. Imagine your dad is a policeman and um, he's, he's in charge of this school 
And one day you are driving, okay? You're driving your car, and the speed limit is uh, 30 kilometers per hour, and you've exceeded that uh, in the school zone. You've exceeded that. You have. Uh, you are now driving at 40 kilometers per hour. The police officer uh, stops you, pulls you over. You lower down your window, and there you see your dad. Your dad, the police officer. Now your dad can do two things. Your dad can show you love or your dad can be righteous and summon you. Church, I want you to know that men cannot fulfill perfect love and perfect righteousness together. I mean, they can't fulfill even one. They, let, but just let's say, let's say that they could fulfill one of it. They could fulfill perfect love. Let's say that men could. Men can't, but let's say they could attain some sort of love and some sort of righteousness. Men can only do either one of them. Because if he shows love, if your father shows you love, and doesn't book you, he's not righteous anymore. But if he's strict and if he's righteous, you would think, my dad doesn't love me. He's booking me. Come on, dad, turn a blind eye. So men church can fulfill only one. He can fulfill love and righteousness at the same time. But church, God is the only one that can fulfill perfect love and perfect righteousness. And he did that church by sending Jesus Christ into the world. When Jesus Christ came into the world, that was a demonstration of God's ultimate love, but also his righteousness, his perfect righteousness. Jesus' righteous act, his baptism, death, and resurrection, that is God's perfect righteous act, the righteousness of God that we say in our church. I'll tell you and I'll prove it to you. Um, this scripture, Matthew 3.15, is a scripture that we all know in our church. But if you're listening for the first time, here it is. And Jesus replied to him, he replies to John, permit it just for now. For this is the fitting way for both of us to fulfill all righteousness. That is to perform completely whatever is right. Then he permitted him, John permitted him. See church, even from the onset at his baptism, it's a perfect act of righteousness. All righteousness was fulfilled on that day. And now after that, Jesus walked perfectly for us three years and he died on the cross. Yes, there was an act of love. That was an act of love, ultimate love. But there's an act of righteousness as well. You know, sometimes we sing the song, the cross is where love and justice met. That's exactly it. Love was shown when Jesus was uh, crucified for us. He took our place. But righteousness as well. Because the wages of sin, as it's stated in Romans 6.23, is death. Somebody had to pay the price. And Jesus did for our sake. Let me share you another scripture. Romans 3 verse 24 to 25 to validate this even more. Pay attention to the scripture church. All, not some, all are justified and made upright and in right standing with God, freely by His grace, His unmerited favor and mercy to the redemption which is provided in Christ Jesus. It continues, whom God put forward 
before the eyes of all as a mercy seat and propitiation by his blood the cleansing and life giving sacrifice of atonement and reconciliation to be received through faith and this church was to show god's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over and ignored former sins without punishment today we are righteous by faith but not just because god felt like he wanted to do that somebody paid the price and that person is jesus christ he died a vicarious death one of the most gruesome death at the cross so church don't you ever doubt Don't you ever doubt or let anybody deceive you that you are not righteous, that you are unclean. Because I tell you church, Jesus did not only pay for your sins with his death, he overpaid for your sins. You are perfectly, utterly, completely cleansed to Jesus water, blood and spirit. You are perfect. You are righteous. Don't let anybody in the world, no devil, no person deceive you of that truth. Maybe you have lived your life and you have heard so many people tell you you are unworthy, but I tell you this, because of Jesus, you are worthy. Because of Jesus, you are perfectly clean. No matter what you have done in your past, no matter what you have committed, You are perfectly, completely and utterly clean and sinless in God's eyes. And you should believe that church, don't let anybody deceive you otherwise. Amen. So church, we've learned that God is love, but he's a God who's righteous as well. God is love, God is righteous. Amen. Praise you God. Now I want to move on to my final point today. I'm not going to be long today. Um I just wanted to share this with you. I want to be very concise with you. Cuz these are the three things that you should know about your belief. Number 3, Jesus is the gospel. Let me repeat that. Jesus is the gospel so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life if we read that we 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 see that if we believe in him we will have eternal life That's what the word of God says. Now I just want to say that this scripture is easily read but it can be so easily misunderstood. Church, when God says believe in him, you must know what Jesus did for you. not just believe in a name jesus because a lot of people will tell you just believe in the name of jesus yes that is true believing in the name of jesus will lead you to eternal life but if you do not know what he did for you what that name even meant what are the righteous acts that he did for you to save you you would be still trapped in your sin and if you are still trapped in your sin you are not saved believing in the name of jesus blindly without knowing anything about jesus is similar to just believing in a random name jack luke john who are these people what did they do for you it's the same 
quit believing in a name like that. But when we believe Jesus, when the scripture says, when you believe in him, the scripture means that you must know what his name means. You must know what he's done for you to save you from your sin. The, the name Jesus means Savior, anointed one. Savior of what? Savior of your sins. If you have not been saved from your sins, believing in a random name called Jesus would not lead you to everlasting life. You'll still be trapped in your sin. You need to know exactly what Jesus did for you. And that's how the scripture can be so misunderstood. Because sometimes we just pluck it out and we share it to people without really understanding what the scripture really means. And I say this with confidence because, church, little must we forget that this scripture is part of a whole conversation Jesus is having with Nicodemus. And mind you, only a few scriptures before in John 3, 5, and I'll read it to you, Jesus answered, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, unless a man is born of water and even the spirit, he cannot ever enter the kingdom of God. So the scripture expects us to know that when you say you believe in him, the scripture expects you to be born of the water and spirit. I didn't realize this, but as I was studying it, I realized it. That we should not just take out the scripture, isolate it on its own, and just share without completely understanding what Jesus said a few lines before, a few verses before. He says, unless you are born again from above or new, you will never know and be acquainted with the kingdom of God. Unless you are born of the water and the spirit, you will never enter. When Jesus says you will never enter, he truly means that. So believing in Jesus requires you to be born of the water and spirit. I know for most of you in our church, you would know what the water and spirit means. But for the benefit of those who are joining us, our guests and visitors, let the Bible interpret the Bible. For some of you, it's refreshing. It's always refreshing for me to let the Bible interpret the Bible. And let's look at 1 John 5, verse 6 to 10. This is he. He here refers to Jesus who came by with the water and blood. And now what's the water? His baptism and his death. Jesus, the Messiah, not by in the water only, but by in the water and the blood. And it is the Holy Spirit who bears witness because the Holy Spirit is the truth. So there are three witnesses in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit and these three are one. And there are three witnesses on the earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree, are in unison. Their testimony coincides. If we accept as we do the testimony of men, if we are willing to take human authority, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, even the witness which he has borne regarding his son. And now this is the scripture I want you to pay close attention to. He who believes in the son of God, if you believe in Jesus, if you adhere to trust in, rely on him, you must have the testimony, possesses this divine attestation within himself. He who does not believe in God in this way has made him out to be and represented him as a liar because he has not believed, put his faith in the testimony that God has borne regarding his son. 
Church, what, what is God saying here? If you believe in the Son of God, you must have this testimony in your heart. You must have the water, blood and spirit in your heart. You must have the water, blood and spirit. What's the water? Jesus' baptism. Why, why Jesus' baptism is so important? Because it's at Jesus' baptism church where Jesus received all our sins, past, present and future. And who passed all our sins? John the Baptist, the last high priest, a descendant of Aaron, the last high priest. Why? Refer to Leviticus chapter 16. And you might be wondering if you've been following NCCKL for a long time. Why are we always bringing you back to the old? Why does the old have something to do with the new? And it's simply because in Hebrews 10 verse 1a, God's word says that the old is an outline of the new. It foreshadows what is to come. So Leviticus chapter 16 is the blueprint of salvation. It's the blueprint first and how God saved men and will save men. And Jesus' baptism is the place where Jesus received all our sins. Let me be clear. This is the place Jesus received our sins. Not at the cross, but at his baptism. And the scriptures back this statement. And there are various in the Bible. And I'm sure you have heard of it in the sermons that we have released before. But this is the place, church, where all righteousness were fulfilled. Remember Matthew 3 verse 15, all righteousness is fulfilled in this place. Both of us, who is both of us? Jesus and John. John needed to be there because John needed to pass all our sins upon Jesus. Past, present and future. Now when Jesus received our sin, what did he do? He walked perfectly for us three years. And ultimately, he was led to the cross, the blood, where he bled for us because the wages of sin, as we have learned in Romans 6.23, is death. And he rose again, thank God, on the third day to prove that our faith is valid and our faith is true. And because of that, when we are cleansed from our sins, when we are perfectly clean, the Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee of our salvation, comes into our hearts. And we are saved. So Jesus' church is the gospel. When we say we believe Jesus, when we say we believe the gospel, we must have this three witness in our heart. The gospel of water spirit water and spirit is clearly preached to us by Jesus himself in John 3 verse 5. But many a times we neglect that and we want to focus on scriptures that we feel resonates with us. If you take one scripture, you should know where it came from. Belief in Jesus includes having the divine attestation, the testimony within your heart. You must be born again of the water and spirit to enter the kingdom of God. Then, only then, you will have eternal life. Amen? So Jesus' church is the gospel. Church, my message has ended. That's all I have for you today. I pray that uh, through this one scripture, You've learned so many things today and that it would remain in your heart. One, number one, God is love. Never doubt that church, despite whatever struggles that you face, know that God has an eternal purpose in whatever He does. And know that as much as He loves you, He's a righteous God. He's righteous in His ways. Only God can be perfect in love and perfect in righteousness. And thirdly, Jesus is the gospel. When we say 
we believe in Jesus, we believe in the gospel of water and spirit. We believe in the witness that God has borne regarding His Son, the water, the blood, and the spirit. And this is the only gospel church that will save your heart. Incredible, right? One scripture, so much to learn, so much revelation. Church, I pray that you are blessed in your heart. Um, I pray that this message has answered some of the burning questions you may have um, coming into today. So I'm just going to pray right now over you. Just close your eyes, church, and receive this prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you have taught us, Father, three beautiful truths from John 3, 16. That you are love, that you are righteous, that Jesus is the gospel. And we thank you for this beautiful gospel, Father, for without it, we would be nowhere, Father. We would be lost. We would be perishing, Father. But because of the water, blood, and spirit, today we are saved. We are made perfect and made whole, Father. I pray, Father, that we will live our lives, Father, here on in for your glory, Father. That we would not just believe what many people say, what the majority says, but we will believe exactly what your scripture has said, Father. We want to know what we believe, Father. And we thank you, Father, that you have ministered to us today through your scripture, John 3, 16, Father. Let our lives never be the same again. And may we walk out of this place, Father, and leave this message a changed person, Father, now that we know what we believe. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.